Let's talk real-time strategy. Do you have fond memories of playing real-time strategy games? Do you get a little spike of adrenaline when you hear that your favorite devs of your favorite series are working on something new and exciting? Do you sit at your window like a love-struck puppy waiting for the news to arrive that an RTS is finally worth playing again? Well, don't, because RTS is dead. If you're like me, you enjoy playing a variety of experiences. If you love a good story, you want to watch something that you haven't seen before. You know how boring it is to play something that feels a little bit derivative. If you're a nerd about new game experiences, then you are constantly searching for something that hasn't been done before. And if you like to just vibe in your games, well, sometimes a change of scenery is enough to keep things fresh. But we've all gotten to that point where it feels like games are getting a bit stale. Things are feeling a little bit samey. But in no genre have I felt this more than in real-time strategy games lately. Why? I've played about as much RTS as I have of shooters and RPGs and simulation games, but I haven't been able to bring myself to buy, let alone play, a new RTS in many, many years. So you're not alone if you felt the same way about the genre. While a slew of RTS games are slated to release this year and next, I'm still waiting to feel something, anything, about any of them. In my eyes, RTS is dead and has been for a little while. But this isn't a video about why RTS is dead. It's a video about whether the death of RTS was inevitable. I'm Max Neal, and this is Voxel. So first off, real-time strategy means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Technically, Solaris is a real-time strategy game, but it's also a 4X game, and it doesn't look anything like other titles in the genre. So I want to say up front that when we talk about real-time strategy games in this video, I mean games like StarCraft and Command and & Conquer, where the core of the game takes place in skirmishes between two or more factions, and where players need to build buildings and command units in order to achieve victory. We'll get into the the subgenres of RTS in a little bit, but when we talk about the death of something, I think it's important to start about how it came about in the first place. So let me bring you back. Oh, not that far back. Okay, that's better. It's 1992 and someone in Britain is growing quite fond of sand. Martin Alper, founder of Mastertronic and president of British games publisher Virgin Gamers, sorry, Virgin Games, gets his hands on the digital distribution rights to Dune. And through a series of backroom dealings that Aaron Burr would no doubt love to have been a part of, offers the rights to French developer Cryo Interactive to develop and release Dune for DOS and Amiga. The game loosely followed the story from the original Dune novel. It was a mix of real-time strategy and adventure elements. You play as Paul Atreides, stuck in a political struggle between House Atreides and House Harkonnen for control over the galaxy's most valuable resource. Oregano. I mean time. I mean spice. The player needs to balance their efforts on the planet Arrakis between spice production and maintaining military efforts against the Harkonnens up until a final battle when, yay! You did it. In a story of game development that is almost too real, Cryo Interactive ran into difficulties during production that led them to lose the rights to create the sequel to Dune, a mistake that would actually lead to the creation of the prototypical RTS as we know it today. So with Cryo Interactive out of the picture, Martin Alper does the reasonable thing and approaches Westwood Studios to develop Dune 2, the sequel to Dune, where you play exactly the same story a second time. Oh, and let's release the game in the exact same year as the original, why not? Where a modern AAA publisher would have likely cut their losses and run, Virgin wanted to squeeze the Dune IP of every last ounce of spice it had. And it's good they did. Westwood developed a game both inspired by Herzog Zwei, one of the first examples of real-time strategy, and this, the Mac operating system. Dune 2 was conceived as a game focused on the battle over Arrakis and the stress and competition between three factions living on the planet, House Atreides, House Harkonnen, and House Ordos, a house that was never actually brought up in the books. I think it may have even been created by Westwood themselves just for the game. 
this conflict made sense to play out as a war game, something that had already been done in 1979 with the release of the original Dune board game. But now it could be brought into the digital space. Combining Herzog Zwei's fast-paced combat, the max use of the mouse to interact with on-screen elements, and Westwood Studios' vision for the universe, Dune 2 was born. While individually the game's mechanics were borrowed from various inspirations around gaming, Dune 2's combination of mouse control and fog of war served as the prime example for RTS games to come. We didn't know it at the time, but the 90s were going to become the golden age for RTS. From 1992 to 1999, the most iconic real-time strategy games got their start. The Settlers, Warcraft, Command & Conquer, Age of Empires, Total Annihilation, Anno, Starcraft, and Baldi's. You remember Baldi's, right? Baldi's? Baldi's! These games were able to run on almost any modern PC, and some on Mac if you were a heathen, and that made them available to a growing demographic, the PC gamer. Since the 90s, we've seen a few examples of RTS on consoles, Halo Wars being among them, but Dune 2 proved that RTS belonged on keyboard and mouse. You just needed a dad who didn't think that video games are making the AOL slow. Don't worry, dad. They aren't. For a while, it felt like there was no end in sight for the genre. I mean, Age of Mythology gave us flying purple hippos that sh rainbows. Well, vu. But Dune 2's standard that defined the genre may have also given it an expiration date. For some reason, the release of quality RTS games in recent times has become more and more rare. Why? Well, around this time, something sinister was brewing. Something that would bring about the death of RTS as we knew it. And it would come from inside the genre itself. The release of Warcraft 3 in 2002 marks a historical moment in the gaming world, not just because of the game's commercial success and birth of my mommy Sylvanas, but rather because of this. See, back in the day, game developers were pretty loosey-goosey with their own games and game engines, and there was a trend in the early 2000s where you could create your own maps, mods, even entirely new game modes inside of a game's world editor, similar to what you can do inside of Fortnite or Roblox or Halo Forge or some modern RTSs today. Well, Warcraft 3 had a world editor bundled with the game that empowered anyone with more creativity than I did as a kid to make just about any game they could think of in the engine. This was the birthplace of Defense of the Ancients, a Warcraft 3 modded game mode where two teams of five players controlled a single hero unit each and competed on a shared map to destroy the other team's ancient, located in the center of their respective bases. It was the beginning of what would become the MOBA genre, the multiplayer online battle arena, and the beginning of the end for RTS. See, Defense of the Ancients started as a side project by Kyle Summer, inspired by a similar custom game mode in StarCraft's world editor that had been created years prior. Eventually, Summer moved on from the project and released the game's source code, and what started as a small idea over time became much, much bigger. Once Defense of the Ancients code was public, several spin-offs of the scenario popped up that would add new heroes, new items, new game mechanics. Dota, as it's called today, became the most popular modded game mode for Warcraft 3. So popular that I know personally several people who bought the game just to play Dota with their friends and didn't touch the RTS competitive and campaign modes. Now, I'm not saying that MOBAs were the reason behind a shift in mass market game design, but MOBAs were the reason behind a shift in mass market game design. Because the genres were so closely related, MOBAs offer a similar tactical experience to RTS games, but the MOBA genre has had an even bigger effect on the gaming industry as a whole due to how it addresses complexity. Dota hit a sweet spot where players could jump into a game with a single hero, a handful of abilities, and play a competitive match without much learning needed at all. Look at this little cutie. It doesn't take long to figure out that Meat Hook drags opponents to you, Rot releases a damaging gas cloud, and Flesh Heap protects you from damage. Now, get out there, you little sack of flesh, go get some Ws. This is the perfect example of a game with a low barrier to entry, or a low skill floor, and a high potential for mastery, or a high skill ceiling. A game that is both simple to learn, but hard to master. 
In your first match of League of Legends, you're given a character with six abilities at the bottom of the screen, a pouch full of gold, and nothing else. Competitive play takes place on the same map every single game. You can experience a victory by relying on your allies even if you are absolute dog tier. And you can play the game for years in the same role, maybe even using the same champion, as long as you play to your character's strengths and avoid their weaknesses. Play and mastery come down to mechanical and tactical prowess, and how well you can rage bait the enemy team in chat. Now, despite birthing the MOBA, RTSs are sometimes infuriatingly complex. To win a competitive match in an RTS, you have to understand the strength and weaknesses, sometimes of over 60 units. You have to learn unique faction capabilities and building orders and memorize various maps and resource locations, military tactics and tech trees. As a single player game, RTSs might throw you a softball in the form of a campaign, but playing against someone who knows what they're doing is humbling, to say the least. In that way, the genre has a high skill ceiling and a relatively high skill floor. In an age where there are so many great games to experience, do you really want to spend hours of free time combing through wiki articles and Reddit posts about topics like how many drones you should be making? The answer to that, by the way, is, uh... I mean, hey, if you do, more power to you. Most people don't. The active player trend for RTSs back this up, and game publishers are catching on. There's a trend in the gaming industry towards instant gratification. This idea that the player should feel capable and powerful within the first few minutes of play. This might take the form of providing frequent short competitive matches, or by giving you a teaser of what your character will feel like in 60 levels. There's no better example of this than in Fortnite, where in your first game, you get pitted against a lobby of all bots without telling you, and then in your second game, you're thrown in with the sharks. Game design like this is a symptom of increasing competition between game publishers for your most valuable resource. No. Not your spice, your time. And so MOBAs, with their low barrier to entry, provide a similar tactical experience to real-time strategy games, but without the prerequisite degree in RTSology. But hey, multiple genres can exist in harmony. MOBAs alone didn't pull out a hit on the RTS. Over time, the genre itself splintered into several subgenres. Real-time tactics games like Company of Heroes 3 or the upcoming Warhammer Realms of Ruin feature controllable units without the need or worry to build buildings. That leaves the player to focus almost purely on the good stuff, the combat. Grand strategy games like Crusader Kings and Total War would take wargaming to a whole new level, where the player's focus is less about recruiting individual units and more on the greater strategic moves, like marrying your brother to your aunt? Yeah, things got kind of weird. Every combat in a grand strategy game represents a small step towards a greater goal, and games can last tens of hours or longer. And then, of course, there's the big daddy of strategy, the 4X. Explore, exploit, expand, and... Exterminate! Dang, a Doctor Who 4X game would actually be really freaking awesome. As computing became capable of handling the scope of intergalactic warfare in real time, 4X games rose in popularity. Stellaris puts you in control of a galactic empire vying for entire star systems against intelligent, okay, often intelligent alien species. And that's not to mention the countless turn-based strategy games like XCOM that offer similar strategic challenges to RTSs, but often on a much larger scale. When we talk about the death of someone, it's often an opportunity to talk about their legacy, and real-time strategy's greatest legacy is perhaps how it spawned so many incredible experiences across gaming. There's something I've noticed, though, across the history of video games. I'm dubbing it the technology leapfrog. We're prone to enjoying playing games that feel like an improvement on what we've played in the past, or at the very least, not an identical carbon copy. And we feel let down by games that feel stagnant, or worse, games that don't fulfill their potential. I'm looking at you, Pokemon! That's why several games in a genre could release in the same year, but still all be worth playing, assuming they provided an interesting story, or a different setting, or a unique take on the genre as a whole. Given enough time, though, it is possible to run out of novel ideas. Just look at the state of FPS games in the 2000s. 
for about a decade, we were stuck in the age of World War II shooters. Medal of Honor, Call of Duty, and Battlefield were all releasing FPSs set in the same era, and it was starting to get old. But we played them because at the time, the technology of games was advancing so rapidly that each title was a technical and graphical improvement on the last. This is the technology leap from. If a genre is starting to get old, if it feels like developers are running out of ideas, a game that is technically impressive can reel us back in again, even if it's set in an era or a setting that we've played before. And maybe that's the reason why RTS feels like it's dying. The technology behind real-time strategy games has reached a sort of plateau, and we've pretty much seen it all. Armies face off in ancient mythology, armies face off in World War II, armies face off in space. Strict RTS games haven't seen much innovation in recent years. Maybe we get some graphical improvements. Okay, we're in 3D now. Maybe we get a few new units. Maybe we get a new campaign. But I think once Supreme Commander and Planetary Annihilation came out, where you could control hundreds of units on a galactic scale simultaneously and manage multiple planets, I felt like there wasn't gonna be much better than this. The gameplay experience of the RTS remains largely unchanged since Dune 2. Is what I'd written until I got word of a new game in development at Bohemia Interactive called Silica. Silica combines elements of RTS and FPS gameplay into competitive matches between two or more teams of players. Each team has one player assume the role of the commander from a traditional top-down RTS perspective. The commander builds buildings and trains and commands units, while the commander's teammates contribute by taking direct first-person control of the units on the ground, either as human combatants or as a roly-poly, man-eating alien species. Silica borrows inspirations from games that came before it, like Natural Selection 2, but it is a breath of spice-free fresh air from recent RTS releases. In fact, Silica is leveraging for its benefit exactly what threatened the RTS genre in past years, advances in technology. As powerful computing becomes more available, games like Silica are able to meld physics-based FPS gameplay into the RTS genre. And it's exactly that that sets Silica apart from other titles. I reached out to Bohemia Interactive and Martin Melicharek, the game's sole developer, to get his take on the game and the state of the RTS genre. And here's what he had to say about it. I think about, you know, creativity. There's this great quote, and I'm going to misquote it, but uh, th this quote that has stuck with me uh, was that the purpose of creativity is give to future generations what was not given to us. But you have had this idea kind of brewing in you and to be able to put that out into the world must be i hope an exciting really really positive really really fun experience for you you want to pass on to the next generations experiences which you really wanted to have but could not for technological reasons and whatever would i would would someone remake dune 2 as it was today but well, there's not much point is there and that was a thing which which there, I really wanted to kind of like experience the action because there was big fiery explosions as well. And I really wanted to collect like, vehicles with fantastic design. I want to experience that. Immersion, I would define it as your brain is convinced you are there, despite you physically not being there, of course. You know, that, that we all know that feeling when you're running from something and you're running and you that door's closing in front of you, you got that enemy right behind you, and you, you see the bullets bouncing off the walls, and you're like, and you get that stress, that specific feeling of stress, and you're like, and you make your. Oh, like secrets being told now, right? But that was just a small part of an hour long interview with Martin. We talked about his inspirations as a game designer and the effect that fatherhood had on the game and who exactly Silica was being made for. If you want to watch the whole interview, you can check it out for free in its entirety over on Patreon at patreon.com slash voxel show, where we're hosting it completely free. But it's also where you can support me and the team that makes voxel happen. Silica proves there are still plenty of new stories to tell, new ideas that could be explored through the genre. But I think that real-time strategy has reached the end of its technology leapfrog. Silica is one example of how RTS continues to inspire future game design, though I admit it sort of breaks the rule I set for ourselves at the start of the video. It is a hybrid genre game, not a strict RTS. So the question remains, 
with games in the genre feeling derivative at this point. Was the death of the RTS genre inevitable? Has RTS died? There are a slew of upcoming RTS games slated for the next few years. Is it even possible for something to be created that we haven't seen before? Or have we reached the innovative limit of the genre itself? And if so, what does that mean for the future of FPSs or puzzle games or simulation games of other genres? You know what I want to know? I want to hear your thoughts down in the comments. And I just want to take a moment to say, holy crap, thank you so much for 10,000 subscribers. You all have blown me away with how quickly the channel has moved and, and grown. It is absolutely freaking amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your support and for being a part of the conversations that we have here, because that's what Voxel is all about. Anyway, you know what's up. Hit me with your, your, your thoughts down in the comments. We wanna hear from you. The conversation that we start around games is core, in my opinion, to what Voxel really is. So I'd love to hear from you. And until next time, see you later gamers.